Good evening, everyone. Um, very good. My name is Homero Rivas, uh, and I would like to welcome all of you to our seminar. We are talking about disruption in healthcare and how we can redesign our business model. Uh, I would like to welcome you on behalf of the MB, the Mohammed bin Rashid uh, University of Medicine and Healthcare Sciences uh, Design Lab. Um, and I am going to be giving this seminar along with uh, my colleague, uh, Thomas Boyat, uh, Dr. Boyat. Uh, he's an assistant professor of healthcare and innovation technologies here at MBRU. Uh, and I'm a professor of surgery and associate dean of innovation in the future. Uh, we're gonna try, we're very excited about this evening. We have actually uh, people uh, joining us from uh, many places around the world. And this is something that can help us, uh, mostly people who are in healthcare, uh, find ways how we can actually uh, redesign, uh, reinvent ourselves when we come with stressors. Um, uh, go ahead, Thomas. Uh, first, I would like to say we really have nothing to disclose. This is a, a purely academic entrepreneur uh, entrepreneurial type of uh, uh, symposium uh, tonight. Go ahead, Thomas. And we have a very brief agenda. We're going to try to keep it very simple, uh, but we're going to little, we're going to talk a little bit about what moves us to actually talk about this uh, strategy uh, tonight. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about the uh, what is the business model and how we can actually simplify things for us. We're going to have a short section of questions and answers, and then we're going to move into a value proposition. Um, uh, at the end, we're just going to wrap up with some uh, more questions and answers. But let's just uh, start by saying that, uh, you know, most of you, you guys don't have to actually be a business owner. You don't have to run a big enterprise but you need to see yourself as a business structure. Even if it's just you and your medical practice or you know, helping uh, people with providing uh, care to them, you need to see yourself as, as a little company and hopefully with this, you will be able to help yourself after tonight. Now, most, most businesses at some point will have some disruptions. And disruption is a word that probably in the last 10, 20 years, it has been freely utilized extensively. And everyone says, well, you know, I, I have an innovative, uh, disruptive type of technology or, uh, you know, a, a very uh, new thing. And, and, and maybe, maybe that's the case, maybe it's not. But clearly, after this pandemic, we do have a disruption, a disruption that, you know, has affected us in many different ways in our uh, personal and professional lives. Go ahead, Thomas. And maybe, you know, it is the fact that we have a new competitor. Maybe it's a new hospital. They just uh, open shop across the street and now we need to find ways how we can actually present ourselves, is ourselves in a different way. Maybe it is a new technology. Maybe it's a new uh, discovery with a new medication. And we have seen it, many of us, that all of a sudden, uh, the operations that we were doing pretty much every day, day and night, we don't have to do them anymore because now there's a vaccine or there's the medication that we can cure that disease. And, and we really need to react in an in, in intelligent way when it comes to things like that. Um, the next one. Well, much less to say. This is pretty much how Dubai has looked. I mean, right now it's... Uh, uh, 9 p.m. and we just have the curfew for those of you who are not here in Dubai and everything's pretty much like this is, is dead in many ways and so we need to identify those stressors that we're going to have in our life so we can react to them accordingly and uh, next one and it'll be very interesting but 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 let's be honest in many situations is going to be for some of us you know either we're too young for our patients. Maybe at some point we're going to be already too old and our patients are not going to see us, you know, with that trust. Maybe it's going to be that, uh, you know, as surgeons, uh, we depend on our hands, we depend on, on 
you know, uh, our, our, our physical state. And maybe at some point uh, we uh, we break our arm or, you know, we're skiing and we're doing something or it could be, you know, someone else in any other profession. It could be a divorce. It could be a death in the in the family. It could be uh, so many different things that can happen to us. And we need to find ways how we can have a creative strategy so we can uh, deal with this in that way. So there's always going to be uh, so many pressuring uh, factors that uh, are going to be uh, facing us. Next one, Thomas. So in this case, how can uh, a clinic, a, a medical enterprise, a company, and I remind you, like you yourselves as uh, a, a, a provider, uh, react to this? So we're going to give you uh, some ways how we can actually identify uh, those stressors, uh, empathize in different ways and come up with a strategy. And the simple, the simplest thing probably that most people do, and I would say like a, a big corporation, one of your employers perhaps, you could have a multi-billion dollar company come and, 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 and send you uh, a bunch of people in, uh, with suits and ties and briefcases and, and just come and do a very extensive consulting of your company and give you a strategy that may or may not work out because it may not be culturally aligned to what you need or actually why not you can do it yourself and when it comes to our professional lives uh, I think with no question this is the way the best way how to do things so uh, now we're going to pretty much enter into our conversation and hopefully you know some of the some of the uh, the things that we're going to be talking about will become very uh, simple and familiar to you as you uh, go on in your professional life and so you can implement uh, this type of knowledge next one and and i'm going to have uh, thomas dr thomas boyad now continue with our conversation thing um is so the big question is, is where to start and, and how to start. And even if you have been working in your company for decades and you, you know your company by heart, you know all the employees, it is not very easy to really have uh, a complete understanding of all the activities that are uh, in your companies because an activity will rely most probably on a lot of people, machines, equipment and processes. And changing one of them will have a huge impact on, on how you will uh, somehow deliver your value proposition to, uh, to your patients or to your, to your customers. So the big question is, is how to start. And in order to, to set the stage, I would like to give a description of what a business model is. Because when I talked about activities, I talked about resources, I talked about processes, it is basically the core of your company, which is the business model is, is how you can generate value and ultimately money. So a business model can be described in many different ways. In this simple definition, a business model is, is representing the rationale of how an organization creates, delivers and captures value. So it is nice. It's a very, very nice uh, definition, but it is still very difficult to grasp what it really means. And not only um, if you haven't really been uh, looking at the business model of your company, but for everyone. And it's not a mystery that understanding the dynamic of business model is something that is very complicated. And maybe you, you recognize these two, two gentlemen. On the left, you have Professor Yves Pinier and on the right, Dr. Alexander Osterwalder. And these two gentlemen have made business model very easy to understand for millions of people. And basically the idea started when uh, Professor Pinier on the left, who was at the University of Lausanne in, in Switzerland, was in touch with a lot of companies that came to him because he was doing research um, at the boundary between computer science and management. And a lot of companies had difficulty to somehow sketch the business model because for startup, but also for big companies, it is a notion that is very difficult to grasp. And he, he has conducted research on this field for decades and people started to come to him. And he started to realize that it is a common problem and not only for small startups, for big companies in Switzerland, but also 
all around the world, it is a very difficult topic to, to really understand. And at the time with Alexander Osterwalde, who was his PhD student, they decided to work on the concept of business model and trying to democratize business model and make uh, people understand how to by themselves create a business model and being able to to have the ability to use the business model as a communication tool in order for them to to create or to or to redesign their business and um, after working for uh, almost a decade they came with the concept of the business model generation which was the first book that that they, they published and that was sold um, i think three million copies in the world so far and the, the book was so successful because it shows that business model can be used as a systematic way to describe the key elements that are involved in the delivery of a product or a service. And through the business model, companies and, and people, CEO, but also managers and, and individuals, they were able to have a common language that was uh, very convenient to ease the communication amongst the stakeholders because when you have an ID, it's very easy for you to explain the, the ID to, you, uh, to your colleague, but sometimes to someone who comes from a different domain, it's very difficult because the understanding of what the business model is will be very different. And then like a language, English or French or Arabic, if you don't speak it, you, sorry, if you don't speak the same language, then it's going to be very difficult to have a common understanding. And then this business model is also required in order to generate this, uh, um, this dynamic amongst the different stakeholders that everyone knows what his or her role is. And finally, having a business model will also reduce the risk of failure by quickly identifying gaps or misalignments because if everyone uses this business model, then everyone will somehow uh, um, co-design this value proposition and realize very early that if things are missing, then they can somehow make some changes in the business model at a very early stage and avoid to, to fail very late. So failing early versus than, than failing, failing late. And now I would like to guide you through these different elements, these dif to, to these different building blocks uh, that consist of um, basically nine building blocks that represent this, this business model. So at the center of the business model is or are the value propositions. This is what you, your hospital, what your clinic is offering to the customer, the different customer segments. So you can have one or several customer segments. For instance, you can have a, a general practitioner who is only, you know, working with, uh, with kids, or you can have a general practitioner that is only working with all the people. You can have a surgeon that is uh, working maybe with a very specific type of, uh, of patient or maybe with two or three types of, of patients. So the value proposition, what the company or the clinic offers and the customer segments. And in the middle, you have the channels. The channels are the way that are used in order uh, to communicate the value proposition to the customer segment. And uh, I'm going through these building blocks now, and later we will take uh, an example. So, so don't worry if you don't understand everything now, it's not a problem. Uh, we, will, we will go slowly with an example. So once we can link the value proposition to the customers by means of different channels. What we want to do is we want to maintain the relationship because we don't want to only um, see the patient one time and that's it. We want to have mechanism in order to maintain this relationship and in order to keep uh, a strong relationship with the patient. So in case of a, of a new hospital, as, as Professor Romero mentioned before, a new hospital is uh, uh, being built across the street. You want to have strong bonds with the, the customer, the patient, because you want to keep this, this patient for as long as possible. And what you want to have is you want to have different revenue streams because the goal of your, of your company is, of course, 
offering uh, a value to the customer, but you also need to have money if you want your system, your business to be sustainable. So here you will somehow um, list the different revenue streams that you will make out of your, your value proposition. So what we've been so far, these um, this, um, five different building blocks are the what. What is your company or your hospital offering? So now we will go to the left side of the business model and we will talk about the how. So first of all, you have to list all the key activities. So in order for your hospital or your clinic to deliver this value proposition, you will obviously have to uh, execute uh, key activities. And for executing these key activities, you need key resources. And maybe you don't want to do everything on your own. Maybe you want to rely on key partners. Your, your value proposition can be half delivered by you and half delivered by a key partner, for instance. That happens in very different uh, businesses, as we will see with the example later. And finally, for running all these key activities and these key resources, you will have cost. And this is where you will list all your cost. So in this screen, you see what is called a business model Canva. This is a Canva that stands on, on a piece of paper and that can be easily used as a way to communicate within the companies, but also with the different um, stakeholders that are part of your business. So I know it's a lot uh, on the slide, but now we will uh, take an example of a clinic and we will see how a clinic can use this business model Canva in order to describe its, uh, its, its business model. And you will take uh, the example um, of a small clinic, uh, family medicine, and we start with the value proposition. So the value proposition will be to offer face-to-face -face consultation. So we think about family medicine that is um, targeting locally based 16 years old and plus non-urgent patients. So very the typical family uh, medicine. And how will this uh, um, clinic be in touch with the patients? Mostly through phone calls, email, maybe WhatsApp or, or text messages. This is this is how uh, um, the physicians or the nurses will communicate with the patient. And now, how will this uh, clinic keep the relationship with the patient? Because you don't want the patient to come only one time because of the flu, but you want the patient to really become a recurring patient, and that the patient really chooses this clinic um, as a general practitioner, a family uh, physician. So you may have annual checkup. So you want to encourage the patient to come every year or every six months to have a checkup and to make sure that uh, the patient is, is in good health doing some preventive medicine. Or you can also run some health campaigns having some marketing campaigns in order to, um, you know, maybe every time that the flu season is arriving to remind the patient that he or she has to come for the flu shot, or maybe you know, if uh, the patient has allergy when the new season is, is starting, maybe to, to ask the, the, the patient to go to the clinic in order to, to have maybe uh, some check on the allergies. And how will this clinic generate money? mostly through uh, paper uh, consultation. So the patient goes to the clinic and, and uh, the hospital will charge the patient. We will see that it's maybe not the patient who is going to pay. This is why it is important to, to then have a look at the key partners. But this is what the, 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 the physician will, uh, will charge the patient for and maybe for medical products such as, um, I don't know, a prothese or some additional uh, product that uh, that, that, the, that the physician can sell. So we had a look at, at the what, and you see we could very simply understand the value proposition and the link between the value proposition and the customer segments and how the, the, the clinic can generate money. And then if you look at the key activities, so what will be behind these face-to-face -face consultations? Well, it's going to be mostly a consultation that, that makes sense and also some documentation. 
May that be to uh, fill in the patient's medical record, also documentation maybe for the for the health insurance. So everything that is linked to the documentation. And in order to perform these key activities, the clinic needs resources. The clinic needs to have physicians, but also nurses and also facilities where uh, the physicians and the nurses work. So this is what is needed for this business to, to run. And as we said before, this business cannot run without key partners. The first one is health insurances, for instance. If the clinic is working with health insurances, that will encourage patients that are under these different health insurances to go and visit this clinic because they know that they won't have to pay the consultation on their own or maybe only partially. And then you maybe also want this clinic to be uh, working with some health regulators, may that be DHCC or DHCA, because without being certified, the, the clinic cannot run simply. And also one of the key partners is an electronic medical record software company that is providing uh, some software to, to the clinic for uh, the purpose of documentation. And maybe the facilities, they require some medical devices to make some, some diagnosis. May that be an X-ray or, I don't know, a CT scan or some smaller uh, um, medical equipment. And maybe you want to have a partner because maybe you want to leverage some sort of, of discount. And all that will cost some money. First of all, you have to pay for the salary of the people. You have to pay for the facilities. You may have to pay for the medical devices or for the software company. And here you can think of different type of cost uh, structure. You can think of either when it comes to um, to the medical devices, for instance, maybe what you what you want to do is um, you either want to have some sort of a subscription that can allow you to rent the different devices. You pay a certain amount of money per month and maybe every two years automatically the company brings you the latest uh, devices. It can be the same for the software or you want to just pay it once and like this, uh, you don't have to think about it for the future. So you can see in one piece of paper throughout these uh, nine building blocks, you have a very efficient view of your business model and you can see the dynamic of your business model. You can see how things are interlinked and you can see what you, when you change a piece in your business model, how it affects the different uh, building blocks and what you have to do in order to make sure that there is an equilibrium uh, in your business model because you want to make sure that that your cost they are uh, smaller than than your revenue stream so you want to make sure that if you cannot afford to buy medical devices maybe you need to rent them you don't have the choice so here you have uh, a view of 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 the business model the dynamic and you see it's a very easy tool to use and now what I'm going to do is I will hand over to Professor Romero who will tell you, OK, what happens now if there is a lockdown that forces you to readapt your business model? Very good. Uh, well, this is basically what happens. So we talk about uh, in the introduction of our talk about different stressors and it could be just a very disruptive uh, pandemic that it's affecting everyone or it could be the new competitor on the block or it could be the new technology or it could be uh, a new medication that not cures everyone or is you know you just became uh, too old or, or you're still too young for your patients you know whatever that may be uh, you're moving uh, to another continent i don't know so you need to uh, Always, always, always when you're, and it could be nothing. It could be just you're bringing a new service to your practice or to the hospital. You know, a new robotic device is being purchased. Well, you need to go back to the fundamentals and you, and you need to readdress your business canvas. Uh, next one, uh, Thomas. Very good. So we have uh, this basic uh, business canvas that uh, Dr. Thomas uh, show us. And once we have uh, the, the stressor that we have a pandemic, well, we really cannot do the face-to-face -face consultations, which is basically the core structure of what we do. 
So we, we need to redefine in a way, and I want you guys to be very open. I mean, this is nothing is absolute when it comes to uh, a, a piece of paper like this, okay? So but you, 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 you literally need to redefine that, that value proposition. And th in this case, let's just take an example of remote consultation. This business canvas, it could be for a restaurant, for example, that you cannot take customers because there's a lockdown. Well, maybe now it's going to be home delivery, for example. I don't know. But, but in this case, we're, we're doing still the same example that we have the clinic. So remote consultation. So we go again, we, we're going to go block by block and we're going to see how things change. And maybe now the customer segment that we had before, it may not be as limited as we, as, as we could have right now because before it was truly a geographical location, as long as you're within the same um, health regulation district, in, in the case of the UAE, it could be in the US, like if you're on the same state that you have your license for, or in the same country, if you're in Europe or in, uh, in the rest of, uh, you know, uh, South America, America, etc. Uh, it, it could be just a different thing, but but now you have a much wider, uh, in a sense, um, uh, target field or customer segment that you can get with this. And you need to identify if those channels that you had before would be actually adequate uh, to connect uh, that remote consultation to your clients. And, and before you had the phone calls, you had the email, you had the WhatsApp. Well, now you have uh, certainly some video conferencing systems. Uh, you have uh, some different ways that you can connect, you know, with things now here in, in the in the region. Uh, Instagram, for example, is very prevalent. Some other places now even people are going into things like uh, TikTok, etc. Next one, Thomas, if you can advance. Very good. Uh, and then also you need to see how you're going to engage with patients. For example, if before we had said the, the annual checkup health campaigns, well, you really physically cannot do that. So you, you really need to come up with very inventive, innovative ways how you can actually maintain them engaged. And maybe those would be through online seminars like the one we have right now, okay, where we actually talk about uh, high blood pressure or we talk about uh, obesity or what's the best nutrition for that and maybe uh, for those who attend, you can give them a discount. I don't know, but but something that you maintain those customer relationships, which are building like really solid blocks uh, for, for the present and the future. And along the same lines, of course, all your revenue streams will be affected because before it was probably the, the fee for service that people come into your clinic and they get checked and this and that, they pay the deductible and they, you know, they go home, well, now it's gonna be very different and now you need to come up with, with new revenue uh, streams, which could be from, yes, an annual sub subscription. For example, if the health district regulation allows you to do that, it could be, for example, for uh, home delivery of medications. It could be from the service of telemedicine. It could be from uh, labs to get checked, for example, in this case for for COVID-19, it could be a number of different things, but you really need to be acutely aware of, of those things so you can actually document them in paper so you can actually have them in your mind. Uh, along the same lines, certainly all the other side of the, of the business canvas is going to change and perhaps now the, the key resources that we may have needed, uh, for example, you certainly don't need a, a huge physical uh, facility. Uh, nowadays, you know, for example, today I saw Oxford University for 2021, there's gonna be all classes that are gonna be online. So there's really not gonna be an, a need for facilities. They don't really have to pay for, for rent, but maybe you're paying for rent or, or you, you, you know, you're paying for a lot of uh, uh, facilities for that matter. Maybe you can do share facilities and that would change not only your, your key resources, but it also is going to change your key partners. Uh, and before you needed, like you, re, you rely heavily on physicians and nurses, well, you, you also now rely a great deal on IT infrastructure and IT people. Uh, certainly with the, the key partners, now you're gonna need to have a very solid online platform. You really need to have like very like speedy uh, internet, et cetera. You need to have all those things. And maybe at some point, 
some of the things that you really rely a lot, for example, uh, some of the medical devices in this example, you know, that you really needed to have in-house, well, maybe they're going to become obsolete because you're not using them and you're using now devices that are actually digitally connected and that people have at home. So you can actually, they go to a cloud and then you can, you know, see their vital signs, a number of different things, and you don't need the whole unit that you were actually paying uh, a big chunk of money for. Um, so certainly your cost, the same way that your revenue uh, streams are going to be changed, your cost structure certainly is going to be changed uh, because, you know, you may not have a lot of uh, capex, let's put it this way, capital expenditures, but you're going to have some share facilities with all the people. You, you, you may be uh, need you to investing or putting much more money on, on software in this case. Uh, and less in, in, that, in that capital equipment. But certainly all those relationships, they have, you have to understand them well, even if you are an employee of a big corporation. Why? Because you really need to uh, talk the talk, so you walk the walk. You really need to understand so people, your, your leaders actually respect you and, 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 and both constructively actually come up with the with the best uh, decision making um, and, and, and negotiation of what's best for the for the practice, for the employer in that case, and for you. If on the other hand, you're your sole uh, business owner, well, uh, with no question, the same way that you really always need to know about what's your value proposition, what is your, your core competence, well, you need to know about what's your uh, business canvas and how you're going to react to that. Uh, very good. Uh, Thomas, any comments here? No, I think uh, that was very well described. What what I would suggest now is uh, to have a look at, at the questions. I saw that uh, uh, people um, sent us some, some questions, so maybe we can have a look at them before we before we continue. So, Homero, I don't know if you see the question as well. Okay, so I see. Let me see. How can business or clinics which run on direct interaction with patients such as dentistry to generate its revenue to adapt to this disruption? Well, I'm not a dentist, uh, but I can tell you, I mean, for a number of years, um, I have had a number of collaborators who are in dentistry and they've been wanting to break in the market of teledentistry. And it's been a big, big challenge because uh, you know, any innovation is going to have a number of barriers. Uh, usually it's going to be the cost of technology, it's going to be uh, that we, the technology is really not, not, not up to date to what the expectations that you may have. It could be a number of different things. However, usually the biggest challenge that we have in, in any sort of innovation is to actually change and adopt the mindset, uh, not really the patients, but actually providers. Now, for example, in this case right now, uh, for, for, for years, I mean, it's not that I have struggled, but I've been pushing and pushing and pushing to, 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 to have like a telepresence when it comes to a medical practice. And it's been very difficult. And nowadays, like out of the blue, like, you know, throughout the world, it's, it's a fact and it's going to stay. And that's, that's, a, that's a great thing. I think with, with teledentistry, uh, certainly you could do a number of different things. Um, from, uh, but, but, but that's where you need to just sit down and, and hopefully, I mean, I know, uh, as I said before, in, in our design um, uh, lab at MBRU, we're going to have a number of different workshops. And one of the workshops that we, we're going to have is how, how can we come up with uh, innovative business ideas through design thinking. What, what I mean with design thinking is you need to empathize with your end customer, you need to sit down and think what they're thinking so you can actually define a problem and you need to you know, go through many different uh, uh, things that could actually solve that problem. Then you can come up with some prototypes if they're physical or just like in, in, in uh, essence of what that solution may be and you need to test those. And it sounds like, like a complex thing or like a very theoretical thing, but this is how big corporations like, you know, Apple, uh, Google, uh, many of those actually come up with, with the innovative ideas. I think if I go back to the question, how to generate revenue, uh, well, you the, the, the key thing, I mean, one idea that comes to mind is uh, recurrent revenue systems 
uh, are those the ones, for example, that you pay for the, the, the fee for a, a gym? Uh, you, you, you know, even though medicine is not cyclical, it's throughout the, the, the year. Uh, certainly in the first few months of the year, people are going to be more engaged in healthcare. Uh, then I wouldn't say that it's a catch, it's a bait and catch, but, but you, you, you get them to actually pay for that for that whole year. So uh, in that way, uh, you know, they, they're invested to come back and hopefully you're invested in keeping them healthy so they don't get in trouble. Other things would be a concierge type of practice where you actually, uh, as I said, uh, pay a yearly fee. You have a, a set number of patients. You don't take any more patients like that, but they, they you, you satisfy the, their needs like a VIP service, like 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So it is on your best interest to actually keep them healthy. And, and so you keep them out of trouble, they keep you out of trouble and everyone's happy. Um, I hope that, you know, that, that helps uh, with that. And we can talk about that privately if needed. Uh, how to handle EMR, electronic medical, uh, uh, electronic medical records or personal health records for telemedicine delivery? Well, nowadays, uh, they're actually, they're actually, Tell them um, right now we're using something called Microsoft uh, Teams and lots of people are using Zoom and you could use, you know, many other different platforms. Those are not really platforms that are built in essence for telemedicine. We have been using them around the world because this is just like the same reaction as if we don't have enough PPE, uh, personal protective equipment, we're going to need whatever we can to protect ourselves. But with this, we need to communicate with each other and we use these devices, but they need to be highly protective, HIPAA compliant. They actually have uh, a, 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 their own server and, and they have uh, their own um, uh, video equipment. For, ex for example, uh, at one of the big places that we work here, MediClinic, we have a great uh, electronic health record called Bayanati. It has everything. Well, ideally, that would have just a, a, a visual platform where you can actually provide uh, not only that, uh, that service to your patients, but at the same time, you can charge, which is one of the other challenges that I don't see here. Uh, but it's a common challenge reimbursement because many of the companies, and it's a, it's, it's a challenge and at the same time, it's a huge opportunity because many times uh, insurance companies, they don't really want to um, uh, provide that reimbursement. But at the same time, if you go back to your business canvas and if you look at your revenue uh, uh, streams, uh, uh, you know, maybe then you can have like a, a truly fee for service without getting the messy sort of insurance and things like that. And, and it's just, it's basically an out-of-pocket service. Limits uh, of telemedicine clinical aspect, uh, certainly, uh, you know, the physical exam, it can be uh, challenging, but nowadays with wearable devices, um, it, it's something you can measure almost any sort of uh, biometric that you want, uh, short of like pressing in the abdomen. Uh, but, I, 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 you know, things are getting better and better. And as I said, we just need to be to have an open mindset. And I think right now it's it's the best timing for that. I, I put a, a comparison and maybe it's too uh, crude, but in the world of surgery, like surgeons 15, 20 years ago, there was uh, the, 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 the new thing with the endoscopic surgery or laparoscopy. And many surgeons who never took it, you know, they, that's, that's it, the, 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 their professional life. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't want to say that it ended, but it, 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 it went into a, a downstream, if not a demise for that matter. Whereas, you know, novel surgeons, younger surgeons, maybe they, they gain a lot of advantages with that. Uh, when it comes to this, we, we always need to take the, 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 the it's it, it's a great opportunity, and it's a, gr a great opportunity to actually bring healthcare to masses, and not just to limit it to a few. And when I say masses, is because you know, with as long as you have a, a good uh, Wi-Fi connection, you can get to most people. Okay. Um, let me see innovative platforms like Juventus that use technology to determine key indicators, guide medical institution disruptions in the field, uh, utilizing AI. How do they remain 
financially viable when all they provide service product make a subscription based service such as models is possible by continuous upgrade should not be easy nothing's easy and whenever you have and and let's say a new innovation a, a sorry a, an innovation when you have a device that it, it does lots of new things uh, and you want to bring it into a company it will not succeed it will not survive unless from the beginning from the get-go you create an innovative business model that is going to be sustainable if, if you cannot do that believe me it could do the best thing ever and it's not going to be sustainable uh, we were talking a little bit about robotic surgery it it has struggled it's it's sustainable because it it does wonders you know it's a marvelous thing but it, it's it, it's it's very uh, cost costly and so it can be a challenge but even then you know it does great things so we just need to come up with a with a good business model and and, and that's going to be the key just quick example in canada canada is way ahead of most places when it comes to telemedicine the reason for that is the government a few years back decided from day to to from from night to day they decided we will pay you providers the same amount if you see someone in the clinic like physically as if you see them uh, at home remotely so that was a huge huge incentive for you know uh, entrepreneurs to come up with telemedicine uh, practices where you can actually facilitate through like uh, you know membership fees to both uh physicians and to patients mainly to physicians a way how they can have a practice online and you know it's a it, as long as you're going to be uh, re, re, uh reimbursed the same it's actually a good thing anyway i think we need to go in yes we need the, to move on a little bit uh so i'm sorry the section yes yeah we won't be able to to answer to to all questions we just need to to move on with the second part of uh, of the lecture um, if you still have, have questions, you can also ask us uh, offline and it would be a pleasure for us to, to answer them. So now for the second part of this lecture, I would like to um, dig a little bit deeper into the value proposition because the value proposition is at the center of your business model and is basically the service or the product that you are offering. And if there is a disruption or if you are starting the business, you want to make sure that the value proposition that you have in mind is matching the customer needs because you can develop the best product or you can offer the best service. If there is no customer that is interested in buying it, then you will you will go bankrupt. So you really need to understand if the proposition, the value proposition is really meeting uh, the need. And in order to do that, um, I will. I would like to talk about uh, another Canva that these two gentlemen uh, designed and invented. So uh, before to, to do that, I just uh, remember having put this slide and uh, the lack or the misalignment of the value proposition is also amongst the 10 reasons for which uh, healthcare startups are failing. And it's not uh, a very old uh, um, article, it's uh, from, from last February. And I think uh, not only in healthcare is the value proposition a big issue, but I think in all businesses and companies are really facing issues when they are rather technologically driven versus user-centered driven because they have a product that they worked a lot on for the last, I don't know, 10 years without really thinking too much about how the, this product will be used or how the market will uh, react to this, to this product. And then they put this product uh, on the market. This is the best product from a, technically, uh, uh, from a technological perspective, but from a user perspective, there is just no need. And that happens really across many different sectors and, and, uh, and businesses. And, and here with this uh, um, Canva, I would like to show you how you can somehow limit the risk of having your value proposition not meeting the needs of the, of the customers. So the first thing that uh, you want to do is you want to identify your customers. You want to know who your customers are. You want to know what are somehow 
the behaviors of these customers, what are the needs, and you also want to know the demographics. And a concept that is also used in design thinking is the concept of personas. What you want to do with the personas is that you want to have uh, um, a representation of your customer, which is a group of either behaviors, needs, or uh, demographics. So you would, for instance, design a customer like this. So this Kinan is not an individual customer, it's a group of customer of a group of patient. And you will somehow treat all these customers, all these patients as one that you will call a persona. So which means that your clinic, for instance, will not only have one persona, will have maybe two or three personas, which are somehow the personas that are equivalent to your customer segment somehow. Why do you want to do that? You want to do that because there is no one size fits all uh, value proposition. You want to make sure that you can customize your value proposition or maybe not your value proposition, but the way maybe you deliver your, your value proposition through the different channels, as we mentioned before. And you want these channels to be uh, um, to be used by these, these different customer segments. So Professor Romero mentioned before TikTok or Instagram. If your customer segment is, I don't know, 60 years old and plus, it is very unlikely that your customers, they are, they, they are using TikTok. Uh, even myself, I'm not using TikTok. I have no idea. I've never launched TikTok. It's because it's used by, uh, by, by a younger population. So you want to make sure that you really understand who is your somehow average uh, a customer uh, a segment. And uh, for instance, here, if uh, um, I want to talk about Kinan, I can put all the people that are the same behavior as Kinan in the same basket, which is, for instance, uh, um, a 34 years old man who has two kids living in Marina and working D in DFC. With these uh, simple pieces of information, I already know that if my clinic is located, um, um, I don't know, somewhere in, uh, um, I don't know, in northern Dubai or in uh, Chimera Lake Towers, for instance, that would be more difficult to attract Kinan because most probably what he does is going from, from home to work and from work to home. So, so if your clinic is located in DFC, then you have more chance to attract him. And then Kinan is in good health and he doesn't take any medication. So it's typically a person that's going to be very difficult to keep the relationship with because most probably he will come and visit you only when he has uh, some, some, some problems, some health problems. So, so you need to establish somehow uh, a mechanism in order to keep the relationship with Kinan. And you know that uh, uh, typically uh, for three days, if he's cold and he has headache and does not sleep well, so maybe it's the typical flu, for instance. So you can classify Kinan according to his behavior and according to his demographic. And then you will somehow tailor your value proposition according to, to Kinan. So once you have um, identify your customer segments, your personas. What you want to do is you want to have an understanding of their journey. So if Kinan wants to go to, to see you, what does it really mean? What are the activities that Kinan are, is undergoing when it comes to uh, coming to, to visit you? And uh, what I would like to show you now is uh, one part of the so-called value proposition canvas. It's basically the right part of it, which is called the customer profile. And this, uh, um, this part of the Canva will somehow allow you to describe what are the jobs, what are the activities that uh, Kina needs to do in order to come to visit you, what are the gains for visiting you, and what are the pains. And you will understand uh, and very shortly why this is extremely important to have this information because you want to make sure that your product or service is somehow fitting with this information. So let's have a look. So first, what you want to do is you want to understand what are the reasons for which Kinan wants to see you. And they could be multiple. They could be uh, from curing the disease to having more energy or maybe to relieve some stress or to being more focused. Anything, any reasons for which Kinan wants to see you as a general practitioner. And 
what you want to know is what it means for Kinan to, uh, to come and, and to visit you. So for Kinan, it might mean a lot. So because maybe Kinan is new in the neighborhood or is new in Dubai, he needs to look for a good hospital, a place that is nearby, either nearby DIFC or nearby Marina. So you know that because you did your research, you did some user research, you conducted some interviews or you did some, some, some survey or anything that can somehow provide you with these uh, pieces of information. So he needs to find a good hospital, then he needs to find a doctor. And then what he needs, he needs to, to find a suitable time in order to come and to see you as a GP. So there is a, a booking uh, process that is behind. He needs to call the, uh, the, um, the clinic and needs to find an appropriate time. Most probably he will not necessarily be able to choose uh, when he wants to see you and maybe there will be some back and forth because he has to check his calendar he has to come back to you and there is a new meeting that comes up in between so so the booking is not like a, just a one-way process it's really something that is iterative and we know in dubai that uh, there is a no-show of between 40 and 60 percent so what you want to do is you want that you want to avoid that that to happen as a gp and then there will be uh, a commute so may that be from his home or, or from his work. And Kinan will be waiting in the waiting room. Then the consultation will take place. Maybe he will have to, to go a little bit uh, uh, at uh, different departments in the hospital in order to collect the prescription. Maybe come to the pharmacy if there is any in the, in the hospital, wait at the pharmacy and collect the drugs. So with that in mind, then you know that there are quite some pains for, for Kinan. And Kinan, he needs to find the time, he needs to find the physician, then he needs to find the hospital to commute, to wait. And maybe Kinan has uh, other pains. For instance, he has needle phobia, which, uh, which can somehow prevent him to uh, contact uh, the hospital or the clinic because he knows that there is a possibility that this is going to happen, that the hospital has to, to take blood for him. So maybe he would wait a little bit or at the at the last minute in order to, to contact you. And maybe uh, he already had unsatisfactory diagnosis from uh, another hospital, so he already starts uh, on, the, on the wrong leg. So this is somehow the customer profile for Kinan. So with that, we somehow know what are the reasons for which Kinan wants to visit the hospital, what it means for him, and what are the pains for him to go to, to visit the hospital. So we already have a lot of information. So now the question is, what is your services or product that you are offering? What are they? And for that, you will have a look at the left part of the customer value proposition Canva, which is the value map. And what you want to do is that you want first to list all the products and services that you have in mind. And if we continue on the example of the telemedicine, what you want to offer is a 24-7 telemedicine service. And to come along with that, you also want to have a database of, uh, of, of physicians. And uh, these physicians will be reviewed by the patients and that will somehow um, help the new patient to select uh, a physician. And you also would like to offer a very quick collection to a physician without any booking. So the patient just goes online and of course he or she cannot choose the physician, but is connected to a physician very quickly. Or you can also have a booking system if you want to choose your physician. You will also offer forum and Q&A for, uh, for questions, maybe in order to, uh, you know, to prevent uh, uh, Kinan to, uh, to wait too long before he, he visits you or she visits you. And maybe you want to have some partnerships with local clinics and hospitals in case uh, Kinan really needs to, to see a, a physician very quickly. And when you thought about uh, all these services, you had in mind that uh, this would help people to, uh, to access a consultation from anywhere. So regardless where they live, a little bit what we do now from home, you will have access to uh, a physician and you can already have uh, an immediate uh, first diagnosis. Then you don't need to commute and also you don't need to book anything. This is somehow the pains that you had in mind. And then you also had gains when you thought about your service. Having, for instance, a centralized review system 
you you have to look at what exists on the market. It is not something that exists at the moment, for instance. You will also have no hidden cost. So you will have a very well um, uh, a, a very well uh, uh, um, page, a very well sorry described page on your website describing all the different costs. So increasing the transparency, which is maybe something that does not exist. And, uh, and as a as a patient, because there is no commuting, then you have more time to do something else, and it also brings more flexibility because the patient can book uh, you your services directly by him or herself. So now what you want to see is you want to make sure that there is a match between the services that you thought of and the needs of the, the patients, the personas and, and Kinan. So in order for that to happen, you want to have your services producing gains that either already exist or reinforcing existing gains or creating new relevant gains for uh, for your customers, for your patients. You also want to have your services focusing on pains that matter for the customer. So of course, maybe you, you thought of amazing services that no one um, has been delivering so far, but if these services are not pains that customers have, then it would be useless for the customer, regardless how amazing you believe that these services are. So you want to make sure that happens. And when these two happen, then you have for the customer, for the patient, an easier job and you provide a better experience. So here with this model, you can somehow limit the risk of having your services not meeting the needs. So if we now come back and we have a look at uh, the example of telemedicine, and here we can we can see how things are linked. So we can see, for instance, that uh, the that the centralized uh, review service can be very helpful for Kinan because if Kinan doesn't know any physician or if Kinan doesn't know any hospital, then he can use this this service in order for him to very efficiently find a physician or a hospital based upon the reviews of other people. And we know how much people like reviews. When we order food, we look at reviews all the time. When we want to book something, we look at review all the time. So it was a very good idea to have that as a, as a way for, for relieving some pain. If you look at the, the hidden cost, it wasn't something that was seen as a pain for, for, the, um, for the patient. So it adds something else. It adds new value to the to the service that, that that you are offering. It's the same for the flexibility. It wasn't directly uh, mentioned as a pain for the patient. Because uh, you don't have to commute, then you have more time to do something else, which is also a gain. But at the same time, it also relieved quite some pain because you have an immediate diagnosis, for instance, then all the problem between commuting here, between waiting, are not there anymore. So the finding time, for instance, where pains for Kinan because he's very busy, like a lot of people in Dubai. So finding time now is not a problem anymore. So he will be able somehow to stay home or from work and directly have access to a service that would take him maybe one hour or two hours otherwise. And because no booking is required, I think I already said that, that, that finding time uh, is not going to be a problem anymore. Of course, you cannot address everything, but it's not the goal. Because uh, again, you, you, if, you, if you want to address everything, maybe your service or your, your value proposition becomes too complicated and then you would need to have uh, too many key partners, for instance, or, or, or too many key resources too much key resources and that you don't want. So it's okay if uh, your service is not addressing everything. But as Prof. Omero uh, um, said before, maybe you also want to offer a service for, for the medicine because going to, to, to the pharmacy and waiting in the pharmacy is maybe cumbersome for the patient. So then what you would like to have is, is you would like to have the possibility for, uh, for the patient to receive the medication home directly within one or two hours. So it's extremely important to, to, to do your, your, research, your user research beforehand because 
the, the, the more you know about your future customers and also uh, the most likely it is that, that your value proposition will, will fit. So when you can meet here in the middle with your uh, services and your customer, then it's very likely that your value proposition will eventually um, find, find customers. Um, Homero, do you want to, to add anything? No? Okay. So, what you have to keep in mind is that uh, it won't work for the first time. So, you have to keep in mind that uh, designing your business model and coming with a new value proposition, it's an iterative journey. And this is why you have these tools that are very easy to manipulate and very easy to work with because you can very smoothly design your first uh, business model or your first value proposition and then test it. Once you have your services and your product, you can go and see customers and you can, with the model, show them what you had in mind. And then they can tell you, okay, maybe that is a good part of it, but this part about uh, uh, bringing medication home, I don't really need it because I don't know, I have a pharmacy next to my door, but this may be the case for this patient, but this will be not the case for other patients. So using these tools iteratively is really the way to go. And as you see on this, on this picture here, it's really only by trying and failing that you will be able to, to have uh, a value proposition first and then a business model that will be sustainable. But when I say sustainable, it doesn't mean that once you have your business model, that it won't change. As we started this, uh, this lecture, there are a lot of events, a lot of uh, uh, disruptions that can force you to change your business model. And it's perfectly fine. Your business model must be something that is dynamic. It must evolve with time and it must evolve with what is happening uh, uh, in your environment and, and in your customer segment. So, what we had a look um, at uh, so far is that we had a look at this part of the business model, which is the, uh, the micro aspect of your business model. This is your internal structure. But you need to consider way more than that because there are external factors that you also need to consider. For instance, uh, we, we, we briefly talk about regulation. So you cannot somehow uh, uh, um, model the regulations because these are external factors on which you depend, but you cannot act upon. So you just need to make sure that you include them in your business model. It's a force that can really impact your business model. So you need to make sure that you understand them. You need to make sure that you have identified them. It's the same for the technology trend, which is the one that uh, we touched upon during during this uh, this, this this lecture. Um, we talk a lot um, about um, artificial intelligence in medicine. So, what are the impact of artificial intelligence for my business model? So, it's not something that that you can really uh, act upon because uh, it's not necessarily a technology that you are implementing now. But maybe you have to consider how can I leverage artificial intelligence for the future. It's the same for blockchain. So we talk a lot about blockchain uh, with patient medical record and enabling patient to own their own medical record and then to, to transmit the, or tra to transfer this medical record to the uh, physicians on, on their own. So how can you somehow implement this technology in your business model? And that's the same for the market. So you cannot control the market, but you need to understand what are the forces that can somehow impact your business model. And it's the same for the macroeconomic forces and that the same for the industry forces. When you have uh, new competitors that are arriving on the market, how can you somehow implement or, or how can you uh, um, include these, these forces in your, in your business model? So this would uh, on its own require to have another lecture, but I was just to tell you that we had a look at the business model. We take we took a deeper look at the at the at the macro perspective of the business model, but that's not it. 
you still have to, to have a look at all the macro aspects of your business model and all the environment that can somehow put pressure on your business model and then impact is, um, is, is success. So before we, we go back to the, to the q and I just would like to talk to you very briefly about the two canvases that, uh, that we use during, during this lecture. So the first one is uh, a part of the business model generation book and uh, both canvases, they, they are free to use. You can download them. You just have to Google them and you will find the sources and you can download them for free. You can also modify them for free. They, they have Creative Commons copyright, so there is, there is no, no problem with that. And um, you can also find uh, copies of, of this book. The first 100 pages are, are for free provided by, uh, by, by, the, by the editors. So first one, the business product generation, and second, the value uh, proposition uh, design or value proposition Canva, which, which, is the, which is the second book. So um, if you are here for, uh, for the CME or the CPD point, this is how you can get this. So I just, uh, I would like to uh, draw your attention on that. You can either scan the QR code or enter the, the URL and you will have to, to fill in a quick uh, feedback form as, as usual and then you will, you will get your, your uh, certificate. It's going to take a bit of time because uh, there are a lot of participants in this session. Within a week you will get your certificate and you will also get your, your CPD point. So I will um, now open the, the question. I see that there are, there are a lot of questions and I just would like to to, to, to go back to, uh, um, to the question about, about feeder therapy. I see that, that the, the Rivas uh, um, told the participant to just contact him. I just would like to touch upon that because this is, uh, this is uh, um, somehow a, a situation that I'm quite familiar with. So uh, I, I'm not sure if you, if you heard of, of the company which is called Mind Maze. This is um, a Swiss company that basically developed um, a system in order to do uh, rehabilitation, it's neuro rehabilitation home. So their system um, is leveraging uh, a, a computer vision and artificial intelligence and using uh, a mobile devices or um, a laptop, uh, um, the, the patient would have access to a couple of exercises and uh, by using the camera of the laptop, the software that uh, MindMaze developed will be able to look at the posture of the patient, first of all, and then to, to help the patient um, have a better posture to execute the exercises uh, um, in, in a better way, but also will be able to measure the progress. So when if a patient, for instance, that suffered um, from a stroke and is, is unable to move the, 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 left, the left arm or it can only move it with a very limited motion, then the software will uh, uh, suggest a couple of, of, uh, of exercises and then the software will be able to, to measure the progress of the patient. And this is, for instance, a technology that physiotherapists can rely upon um, if uh, they are unable to, uh, to be in directly in touch with the patient. And of course, if that happens for the clinic, there will be a big change in the business model because most probably the clinic would like to have this company as a key partner to be able to, uh, to deliver this, uh, this, this software to, uh, to, to the patient. So I just wanted to touch upon that because I'm, I'm aware a little bit of, of the problem and, and some of the solution. And I will now hand over to, uh, to Prof. Omero to have a look at uh, the other open questions. Uh, very good. Um, let me just uh, now. Is there a way I can share my screen? Just I just want to. Uh, I'm sorry, you cannot do that. I cannot do that. That's yeah. fine. I will just send you a photo, maybe so you can share it with the audience. But uh, anyway, um, I um, uh, Dr. Thomas. He comes from a uh, from Switzerland. A uh, very civilized place. I want to say I also come from a very civilized place, but it's a different structure. I come from Mexico. Uh, people are highly resilient and we have to be, whenever you have uh, scarcity, you have uh, uh, great creativity and you come up with uh, great innovation. 
Uh, and so, uh, yes, uh, some, you know, he talked about using AI and doing all this software and things, but sometimes that can be a, a, a huge limitation for many. And so you certainly, we nowadays have uh, lots of uh, ways, you know, everyone has a phone, Every, most phones have a camera. Uh, so you can come up with, people have come up with many different ways how they uh, actually uh, do some physical therapy by posting videos, receiving videos, analyzing those videos, uh, having the videos analyzed by third parties. So meaning people who actually receive a, receive a little training as far as the proper, what's proper, what's not. Uh, that may not be the best. And of course, uh, like through uh, physical therapies, maybe just uh, raising their, you know, their, their hand and screaming, saying like, oh, that's, that's not right. Uh, but 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 there are ways that you can actually come with with simple very simple uh, innovations that could be low cost uh, and, and certainly that you have to just uh, be open for them. Now I receive a number of questions. I answer many of them directly. I am going to bring some of them just to uh, talk about them. Uh, there was uh, certainly uh, some comments uh, that had been raised before and usually that, that, that happens all the time about drawbacks with telemedicine and as far as the inability of physically examine uh, and elicit signs, uh, certainly taking a history and, and decision, you know, and, and coming up with decision uh, making through telehealth would be possible, but maybe there's a better way how we can just do uh, use AI and uh, triage patients more efficiently. Uh, and of course, my answer is like, you know, nothing's perfect. Really, there's nothing perfect. I think we must uh, take advantage of the situation, leverage on the positive things, leverage on the, on the, on the fact that uh, regulation is actually very open uh, for most of everyone to use telemedicine. Uh, and that is uh, something that uh, it was impossible to hear about like just a few months ago, uh, not to say years ago. Uh, uh, certainly, I agree uh, using AI and hopefully at some point every emergency room, every emergency room before they actually even register, you know, they go through a, like a door frame that gets all the biometrics and then they say like, listen, this guy is in shock or this guy needs prompt attention. Uh, we know it's unheard, it's not unheard like in the US, lots of people die in emergency room just waiting for hours and hours and hours and they haven't been, even been uh, seen by, by anyone. So uh, we uh, certainly have, way, you know, a, close to 70% of the ER visits don't need to be in the ER. So we know that by means of telemedicine, we can capture a, a, a great uh, uh, market and we can relieve actually the infrastructure uh, the professional infrastructure, the human infrastructure that we may have at the hospital. Um, there were some other questions which actually I publish. Um, how can we make sure that we uh, create a persona uh, that is representative of our, of our customer segment? Uh, well, this is something that, you know, you need to be savvy about what you do. Uh, you know, a pediatric surgeon, uh, certainly they know about how to take care of operating kids. Uh, but they also know that uh, it's more than just kids. It's actually they need to engage with their parents and, and they need to know that there are going to be some very difficult pa uh, parents, there are going to be some easy ones, uh, and, and, and you just need to know the whole thing. You, you need to be acutely sensitive to your, to your market to come up with, uh, with those personas. So, you, uh, you know, not everyone may say, may have that sensitiveness. I mean, we all have our, uh, our uh, core competence or some the competitive advantages, put it this way. So there's some people who are better with words than others that are better with what they do. There's, there's physicians who have no social skills, but they are uh, amazing uh, clinically uh, and, and, and with what they do. Uh, but but we, we need to do what we do best and outsource the rest or buy the rest. So if you don't really know how to do this well, then you, you know, you can, you, you certainly uh, are welcome to come and visit with us. We can help you uh, identifying these personas. Uh, usually a market agency, that's what they do all the time. They identify, well, who, who's your customer segment? 
Do you want like all people, young people? Do you want people with disposable income? Uh, do you want people who are have very complex diseases? Do you have someone who just has acute illnesses, et cetera, et cetera. And then you start building upon those things. Uh, a very good resource usually uh, would be, for example, uh, business school students uh, here at the design school as well. Now we teach all our medical students, all our medical students in year one, they get uh, a class that is it's it's a it's a part of the mandatory curriculum for medicine uh, in uh, innovation uh, innovative healthcare technologies and they go through the design thinking method they have to come up with uh, basically a description of their personas when they're coming with something like prototyping uh, do, doing the, the whole thing and, and sure of uh, coming up with a new company and if i can if i can add something on my yes. So there exist also some some canvases so similar to to the two canvases that we introduced to you tonight. They, they exist canvases that will help you to do uh, user research because this is this is what you need. Basically, you need to understand your, your patients. You need to uh, not only understand uh, um, um, what they go through, but but also to understand the environment, to understand the context in which they that they are. And to do that, you can use use, use canvases and uh, uh, you can also send us uh, an email and uh, we, it would be a pleasure for us to to forward you this uh, this canvases but of course you can also ask ask someone external to do that but if you want to to do it on your own it's also possible and just keep in mind that uh it's an iterative process so um maybe there are i mean there are many things that that you you don't know how to do that i don't know how to do but a way to go is just to try because, uh, uh, you know, all these processes, they are iterative and it's only by failing that you will understand how you can improve your way of either connecting with potential patients or just trying to identify patients or to, to describe them. So, so don't be shy if you if you can, maybe, you know, as, as Dr. Uh, Omero said before, sometimes depending upon your personality, it's more difficult to, to just go and talk to a patient. But if you feel like doing it, yes, there are many different ways that can somehow help you and support you in doing uh, user research. And, you know, it's interesting. They will change this, this personas because at some point there's a new app. For example, now everyone's on Instagram and, and you thought your persona was just to communicate through email and like, you know, sending a beep or something. And that's clearly outdated. Um, one of the things, you know, uh, that, I, that, that I, I really like to engage with patients and I just, of course, I talk to them about their, their problems and how they feel and all those things. But I also sometimes I just just for just for fun, like, you know, so what brand of, uh, you know, what, what, what do they drink as far as like coffee? Do they drink here or do they drink that? And th th that's how you you actually learn uh, more about uh, about your personas. You, 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 you know, you, you, you work on that. Now, lastly, I mean, there's another question, very important. How can you make sure your liabilities overhead, uh, you know, with all these new models? Uh, well, you really need, that's why you, you guys, and I commend you for being here tonight because you really want to learn something different. Uh, it takes a, a lot for very ex experienced people to actually say, okay, there's, there's going to be something I don't know, let's, or I don't know a lot of, let, let's try. Uh, but, but you really need, uh, well, you need a, a good lawyer. You need a, a good, not only, we all have a, a malpractice insurance coverage, but, but now with this, we really need a telemedicine malpractice coverage, which is, the, you know, there's such a thing because you need to, uh, you know, have all those requirements. You need to have a very detailed uh, informed consent when you deal with patients. And with no question, the most critical thing is your communication skills with them, you know, to have a good rapport with them and to make sure that they, they feel, they feel uh, heard, they feel uh, listened, they feel understood, uh, and that they, you know, that, that they are okay with what you're going to do with them. Um, I would say any other comment, Thomas, before yes, we just... Yes, there is a question about uh, some marketing, some advice regarding how to set up a marketing around telemedicine platform. So I will give a, I will give a shot, uh, Omero, and maybe you can complement my, uh, mm -hmm. my answer. So I think it depends very much what you would like to market. So um, is it you want to market that there is this new telemedicine platform and that 
the patients should use it instead of uh, coming to see you? Or is it something that uh, a fear from the patient that maybe their uh, uh, privacy will be broken if they use this telemedicine platform? But there again, it is very important to, you, to use this value proposition Canva because you need to understand uh, the fears and the hopes. So you need to understand what you uh, patients are looking for and also what they fear, what they would like you know, to avoid. And if, for instance, they have a fear of having a break in the commerciality or, I don't know, data privacy or something like that, then when, when you want to create your marketing campaign for uh, promoting your telemedicine platform, you need to emphasize on this aspect. So that is more around, you know, the message that, that you want to give to you, to your patients. But then there is also the way you want to give the message. And here again, you also need to understand uh, the, the, the demographics of, you, of your customer segments, because as I touched upon before, if um, you, you, your patients, they are, I don't know, between 25 and 30, maybe you want to promote your telemedicine platform through Instagram because this is the channel that, that they are using. Or if they, if they are maybe a little bit older, you want to use email, so I don't know. So this is why you really need to identify your customer segments, create your personas, and then once you have done your user research, then you can um, have a look at all the different aspects that are behind creating a marketing campaign. So my answer is that I cannot directly answer your question because I don't know um, enough about the context, but what is important is to really understand well who are your targeted customers, and then once you understand the demographics, the needs and the behaviors, then you can try to see how you can create your marketing campaign and deliver this marketing campaign to them in a way that is really efficient. So my only things, you, you need to learn about yourself. You need to learn about what's, what is it, what's your secret sauce that makes you different from everyone. And so when you know what, how is that you're differentiating yourself, then you need to you know, leverage on that. And, and there's a huge difference in, in, in what, you know, what would be an ad campaign versus marketing, because you, you really need to uh, understand through those personas what is that they need, how is that they think, how is that they feel, how is that they get their information. And then in that educated way, you need to deliver uh, what you can offer to them. Uh, but for that, you need to learn about yourself and you need to learn about uh, the others. Um, and, and, and you must work with, uh, you know, with, 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 the, with the people who are in your, in this case for us being in, in the medical system with your administrators, with your, your, your marketing uh, people, with uh, your patients uh, and go through those. Now there's going to be a lot of organic uh, sort of uh, uh, marketing and that could be done through uh, social media, it could be done through seminars. Uh, the, 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 the most efficient way of marketing usually worldwide, like throughout times, is being word of mouth. There's no question about it. Okay. Uh, Laz, there's a question about the uh, role of telcos in uh, telemedicine, uh, launching telemedicine services at additional value add. Well, it's just uh, basically, uh, it's going to be the, the, the major uh, players in the in the uh, telecommunications arena, which uh, in the case of the UAE uh, probably would be, uh, uh, help me out, uh, Thomas. Uh, Etisalat. Etisalat, uh, Du, um, and, and so on, as they would be different in other places. But I, I think the, uh, the key is to come with a minimal viable product uh, I then identified what is the your 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 competitive advantage, leverage on that, uh, what differentiates you from the others, and then bring that to you know evidence uh, to to your customer segment. Uh, that's what I think. Uh, I think we have uh, we have basically come up to the end of our mm -hmm. of our seminar. I would like to thank all of you really for your interest. I think uh, once again I commend you for being here. 
it takes a lot for very uh, experienced people with busy people to actually uh, come and, 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 and spend some time with us. Uh, we hope that uh, this has been of good value, great value for you. Uh, please send any comments or questions, uh, ideas of what you would like to uh, to see in, in, in seminars like this. We don't really have to be in the midst of a pandemic to actually have a very constructive uh, uh, seminars. Uh, and I am sure that in the near future, we're going to come up with, uh, you know, uh, some uh, very interesting concepts uh, and bring people who can add uh, great value to the conversation. Uh, thank you again and, and, and stay in touch. And Thomas? Yes, so thank you everyone. And um, in the chat, two people asked me to, to copy and paste the, the link to access the, the, the feedback and to get the, the CME points. So I'm, I'm going to do that uh, as soon as uh, uh, we, we just end this, this talk because I need to, um, I need to stop the, the sharing of my screen. So again, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, please stay tuned and uh, Check, check our website, MBRU Design Lab, and you will see at the bottom all the different events that are happening and also the our, our, our mother website, the, the MBRU, and you will also have a look at, uh, at other events. So thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.